All right. And you are officially at our nonprofit tech club meeting for March 1st. We're just a week after the big snowmageddon or whatever you have it, but we are in business and thank goodness it uh, didn't hit this week. Um, so I today get the honor of hosting this meeting. Normally that falls to uh, Carolyn Appleton, our fearless leader, but um, you know, we're just a part of a network, as Eli was telling you, about of tech clubs around this, like this around the world. We've worked together with uh, TechSoup, NetSquared, and a number of other organizations and, and 10 and all of our programming, it is free for everybody. So thank you for being here. Please do help spread the word. We're uh, happy to be part of just helping nonprofits up their game and with when it comes to technology. Um, we have a lot of events already planned for this year. Um, as you can see, we uh, get to see Dallas Emerson, who I'll be uh, introducing in just a moment, but we also have good events coming up in uh, future months. So please do stay tuned for those. Um, and of course, we are uh, not just grateful to, to Eli for helping us like manage all this technology uh, to, to kind of be the backbone support for these presentations, but also the Capital Factory, who's been a generous multi-year supporter, HEB, the Capital Factory, oh, I already mentioned them, and uh, Trinon Coffee. These are um, all uh, multi-year supporters of ours, and we're really grateful to them. Also grateful to ATB for keeping us fed uh, during these crises against within a crisis that we're living we've been living through, and of course, really this couldn't happen without the different volunteers that we have with this group. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, Carolyn Carolyn Appleton, she would normally be hosting and introducing everything. She wasn't able to make it tonight, but uh, she really is the glue that holds this group together and does so much work for it. But we are also very grateful to Susanna Erler for her work, Nevin Kamath. Carly Martin, Dale Thompson, and Carl Webb, all of whom uh, help us to make this group what it is. So thank you all for being here with us. And of course, if you do need to follow up with us later or just want more information, um, you know we have a bunch of different places you can follow up, TechSoup, NetSquared, um, the N10 page. Um, hopefully you found us through the, the Facebook page today, but uh, if you didn't, uh, you know, just send me a little private note in the chat tonight and uh, I'll get you the, any of these links that you might need. And uh, with that, let me tell you a little bit about our presenter tonight, Dallas Emerson. So I'm going to stop the share. And, you know, I got to meet Dallas. It was um, about, I think, four-ish years ago um, when I was still working over at Mission Capital. And he was up there getting to meet some people and things like that. And uh, Dallas, he's been with the IT guys for six, 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 seven years now. He's their leader of business development, which means he goes out and he helps nonprofits get connected to what IT guys does. And what do they do? They help nonprofits really make sure that their, their back office IT infrastructure, it's all working well so that your staff can really focus on doing their jobs, right? It, and so for small and medium nonprofits and associations, you probably do not have a staffer on hand who gets to focus their time on understanding how all the technology works and uh, keeping up to date and all that and just being able to do that. And that's what makes a uh, service like IT Guys so great. And it's uh, the kind of service that I've really grown to, grown to appreciate as a professional over the last 10 years because for small and medium nonprofits, we can't afford a full-time person who understands all the tech, much less somebody who can understand servers versus phones versus the internet interfaces and all that kind of stuff. And that's where a service like IT Guys comes in is they help make sure that you have all your security and all your other pieces working correctly. So if you don't have something like that, you should really look into it. Um, what else can I, I tell you about uh, Dallas? He's a graduate of Texas Lutheran University. And um, yeah, with that, you know, I don't wanna get in the way of Dallas helping us to understand some of this crazy tech jargon. Um, because there is a lot of it out there. And that's why we've uh, brought them here to you guys today so that you can kind of help cut through all the, the stuff and really un get a better sense of you know, what's going on in the, uh, the IT world and how does that relate to us at nonprofits. So with that, I'll shut up and uh, turn the table, the, the floor over to you, Dallas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, let me share my screen here real quick. And let's bring this up so you know i'm i'm happy to be here i'm excited to be here oh here i'm 
in the office, uh, the same home office I have been in uh, for the last year since our first two week lockdown a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, but I'm excited to be talking to all of you, uh, and I'm honored uh, because Austin has been through a lot, and don't let my name deceive you, I am in Austin. Austin has been through a lot in the last year and in the last month, especially the last week, as Sean pointed out. So it's great to be here talking to people who are working to make Austin a better place to live, a better place to work. Uh, I, I really do mean that. It's one of the advantages to... Um, working in this environment, in this universe of nonprofits. You know, Sean made clear, I am not in a nonprofit. Occasionally we are not profitable, but that's not by design. Uh, but you know, there, there's a certain benefit to knowing, okay, I worked with somebody who uh, helped a child find a forever home or who helped, you know, fix up a, fix up a house for somebody, something along those lines versus saying, well, I help somebody sue their competition slightly more effectively. So I really do mean it. I love nonprofits. I love working with nonprofits. Um, I want to take a moment before I dig into this uh, and just apologize up front uh, if my voice begins to get crackly or if I seem somewhat uh, distracted. I have been sick for about four straight days. So uh, this session is brought to you by cold and flu medicine. Um, so let's just dive into it. Um, how to talk tech, translating the jargon and BS of IT. You know, when I first talked about the session with Sean, with Carolyn, months and months and months and months ago, I kind of had this ambitious goal, uh, but I wanted to, uh, of trying to turn people into ad hoc IT experts. So what I wound up doing is I had a number of conversations with people, uh, people in the nonprofit universe to kind of figure out well, what kinds of things are on your mind. And as Sean just pointed out, interestingly enough, one of the things that was on their mind was not becoming an IT expert, which took me uh, aback a little bit because I thought, oh no, what am I supposed to be talking about? If I'm supposed to be talking about jargon and BS, translating this for, for people, what is the real problem here? But you see, there was a problem. Uh, and let's think about this uh, basically in terms of a language course, if you will. The problem isn't necessarily that non-profiteers want to learn the vocabulary of IT, it's that they struggle with the way that that vocabulary is delivered, I have found. You see, in my ambitious goal, I you know, brought up a number of topics. There's about 7,000 different things we could talk about from you know, cloud computing to different kinds of computers that you could use. But the thing that I encountered the most, what most people really seemed to bring to the table was, I don't get how IT people think, or I think my IT person might kind of be a jerk, or am I just bad at talking to this person? Because every time we start talking, I get either confused or frustrated. And so what I found was time and again, I was in this conversation where people said, yeah, I don't have time to become an expert. I don't have time or the inclination. You know, I didn't get into the nonprofit world because I wanted to fix a printer or to make sure that my network was running perfectly. I got into the nonprofit world because, you know, I wanted to help somebody or help an institution or build something. And so I was left in this position where I realized that the problem when people talk about jargon, see, when I, when I use the term jargon and BS, everybody has an idea of what they think that means. But what it really means at the end of the day is communicating with this guy your average IT person. And I'm going to stop for a moment here and, and note a couple of things. I'm going to use the term tech a lot or tech expert or IT person, and I am going to be using that in kind of a general fashion. Um, but, you know, Sean had said I've been with the IT guys for six or seven years. Uh, I've been working on the nonprofit aspect of the IT guys for six, and seven, for six or seven years now. I've actually been working with the IT guys um, since I was 12. Uh, so that is uh, 13 years, I guess, going on 14 now. Um, and so I've been around techs essentially my entire life. I know these people. I myself am techie, but not necessarily a tech. Uh, and so when I talk about techs, it may sound like I'm using gross oversimplifications or stereotypes, but there is a basic type of IT person. And it's in talking with those experts, those technology experts that we really see the trouble come forward where this language barrier becomes very clear. You know, 
we interact with all kinds of experts every day. A lot of us are having to interact with plumbers right now because our pipes are burst because it's Austin and it froze over. What I've noticed is people don't tend to complain about jargon from, from plumbers or from electricians. The complaints about jargon come when we talk about technology. And the complaints about BS, if you will, come when we're, when we're in these technology situations. And so what I want to do is, is when we're talking about this language, this, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, this dialect of English tech, that um, I want to help understand how it's communicated. You know, I took language courses in high school and in college. Uh, at high school, I took Latin. In college, I took Spanish. I can say for sure that it's much more effective to learn a language that people speak rather than a dead language. But, you know, in these Spanish language courses, I would learn about maybe the Cuban culture or some festival in Guatemala. And I thought, why are we doing this? I need to know the vocabulary. I need to know how to ask for help or, where, you know, how to tell somebody I need to use the bathroom or something like that. But there is something really essential about understanding the mindset behind a language. And that's really what we're going to dig into here, because you don't have the time or the inclination, as Sean pointed out, to become experts. Oftentimes, we need to rely on somebody, whether it's a full-time person on staff, a part-time person, a contractor, or somebody you just turn to for advice. We all have to have these conversations. And so it's in that, you know, turning to somebody in for, the, for these conversations that we find the difficulty, right? Um, because that's where the gap begins. And so my objective here as a person who kind of lives half in the nonprofit world, half in the tech world, is to help fill that gap and stop this from being the end result of these conversations. You know, one of the first things I want to say is occasionally people will say, that, why can't tech people just speak English? Well, maybe they're trying their best, which is a terrifying thought. Maybe they're trying their best to speak English, to, to, to try to communicate a, a series of complex ideas, and they may just not be very good at it. So what I want to help you to do is understand the frustration that can build there in this jargon to help translate, okay, what is the diff, or to help understand what is the difference between jargon being just a set of, of uh, terms uh, that are pretty much exclusive to one uh, industry, right, and BS, which is lies. And to do that, I have to kind of help you understand the mindset there so that we can get better results, we can get fixed problems so that you, as a nonprofit leader, can get back to working on your mission. Now, I want to stop for a moment and address something that, you know, there's kind of a, a, an idea that there's a lot of not very nice people in the tech world. And I'm here to tell you that is somewhat true. I would say there's probably more jerky people per capita in the tech world than just about anywhere else. And certainly a lot more jerky people per capita in the tech world than in the nonprofit world. So you might be wondering, why am I talking to the nonprofit people who have already identified as the salt of the earth rather than talking to the tech people about how to change their ways? Well, like I said, I've worked with techs pretty much my whole life and it's a lot easier to talk to nonprofit leaders on how to communicate with techs than talking with techs to try to change how they communicate uh, in a general sense. There's some specifics we can work on, but uh, also they don't have a club and you do. So one of the first things I wanna talk about is this. Have you tried turning it off and on again? I bring this up because it's the classic example. Uh, a, it is a stereotype that is 100% true. We do ask that, text do ask that you know, at, at first every single time. And B, a lot of times it seems like it, BS. Why are they making you ask that? Well, first things first, it works. But what you have to understand is that a tech, when you're speaking with them, um, this is almost a test to see if you have invested the time of turning your computer off and on or whatever piece of equipment it is, to make sure that you've invested that time before you came to them. Uh, it's kind of a way of figuring out how is this conversation going to go. Um, so this is an example of something that occasionally feels like BS. And I believe it or not, this is one of the most common complaints I get is somebody say, why do I always get that question? Well, A, it works. B, it's a tech checking to see if you respect their time enough to invest that little bit of time up front. But you know, while we're on the subject of, of, uh, of stereotypes or of, of uh, things that just, you know, we can't seem to get away from, the most 
the largest pop culture image of a tech, of an IT person, is this man, Dennis Nedry from Jurassic Park. Now, spoiler alert for a near 30-year-old movie. He's not a great guy. Dennis Nedry feels overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated. Uh, he's the sole IT person for a massive park in which they claim they spared no expense. Um, and Dennis Nedry is 90% of techs. Many of them feel overworked, undervalued, underpaid, whether they are or not. So there's a kind of an immediate resentment built into the mindset of a tech. And that's made worse by the fact that in the nonprofit world, techs might as well be aliens. You see, in the nonprofit world, you don't need to, me to tell you this, but I'll just say it. You tend to be people people, not necessarily that you're, that you're extroverts, but nonprofit people. If you get into nonprofits, you're probably not there for the money. You're there because you want to help somebody. Well, techs aren't necessarily people people. And I don't mean that they're all introverts, but they tend to think about things and systems as opposed to people. So in this sub industry or in this industry of nonprofiting or nonprofiteering, they are alien. They're weird. They stand out and they can feel that, uh, as I'm sure you can feel that too. So on top of this kind of feeling of I'm not, you know, I, uh, I'm overworked, they also have a hard time connecting. Uh, now, as bad as our image of text is, as I've just laid out here, I got bad news for you. Text, at least the jerk the jerky kind of techs, have an image of users, of people who use technology. They often view users as unsophisticated. And I can use this image. I come from a, a long, proud line of uh, rednecks, so I get to use this. But there is the very easy ability for uh, a tech to feel a sense of superiority. We're going to get into that. If you ever feel like a tech is talking down to you, and that's what I tend to come across the most, right, is complaints of, of condescension. There's a chance that they really are. There's also a chance that they aren't. And that's what I want to help clarify is when is a tech being problematic and when are we just having a miscommunication? You know, I'd mentioned that techs think about things and systems. It's partly a result of just their, their job, but it's also because of their personality type. Again, Speaking in broad terms, some techs are very people oriented, but their job dictates they think about things in systems. Uh, whereas most nonprofits are dedicated to getting through today, making sure you've got enough funding to survive the year, making sure your programs are successful and making sure that you know, your overhead ratio, which we all know doesn't matter, but is still evaluated, is, you know, it looks correct. From a technical perspective though, a tech can set up something that is perfect, right? there is a way that they can actually create a system that has no flaws, right? Because you can theoretically create a computer system that is perfect. Well, obviously that's never gonna happen in the tech world, or I mean, in the nonprofit world. So there's that. But in their process of trying to, of creating perfection, you know, there's, there's kind of a, it's not apocryphal, it is a real story. I actually know who said this. There's a, a joke that goes around that a tech is asked by a, an executive, what can we do to make our systems run better? What can we do to, to you know, be a little bit quicker to, to kind of work some of the problems out. And the tech responds, get rid of the users. Because in the tech world, it's generally speaking, people that are the problem, right? The computers didn't break themselves, somebody had to, from the tech's perspective. So there's already the, the knowledge that they're never going to achieve perfection. And it's gonna be worse because in the nonprofit world, so often they're working with outdated or at very least stretched equipment. So for a moment, when we're thinking about these miscommunications, these struggles in leadership to connect with the person that you need to connect with to make an, an informed decision, put yourself in their shoes for a moment and realize that, you know, sure, yes, uh, you as a nonprofit leader are very stressed trying to make sure that everything is going to come through okay at the end of the year. But from their perspective, they have this goal that they'll probably never achieve. And that builds in a certain amount of stress right away. And that stress is going to be carried forward into communication. I say this because techs as not very strong people people also tend to not have very much empathy, which means they don't necessarily know how they come across, which means their tone can be hostile when they don't intend it to be hostile. And they often have poor filters. And those poor filters often come about as a result of kind of the expertise spectrum. 
you know, there's a, an odd thing in the human psyche. The more expertise you gain in a given subject, kind of the worse your people skills become. Uh, think about artists, for example. You know, uh, Vincent van Gogh was not known for his people skills. He was plagued with mental health issues, but he was a genius artist. Steve Jobs, brilliant, very difficult man to get along with. And in just the same way, you're the techs who spend their lives trying to hone their skills to become as good as they can at their task, oftentimes wind up actually worsening their people skills over time. So this creates a problem. We live in a nonprofit world where people, generally speaking, are at the center. It's populated by people who care deeply and who are deeply empathetic, which is probably why they got into the nonprofit world. And you need to connect with these other alien beings over here or who are aliens in their own environment, right? If they're working in the nonprofit world, they don't fit in. And their profession draws them further and further along this uh, expertise spectrum that can cause even greater conflict. This is made worse by the fact that the only real way for techs to gauge their expertise is to compare themselves to other people which is inherently competitive. Whether they know it or not, they're looking around and going, okay, do I have this skill? Do I have this skill? Or how good am I at this thing? And they turn around and they go, wait a minute. Okay, he doesn't know this. She doesn't know this. They don't know this. Okay, I must be pretty good at what I'm doing. Now you'll notice here what I'm talking about, talking tech, to just slow down for a moment. This is all about psychology. This is entirely about understanding the mindset behind it to try to get a smoother technical conversation. Because if you have a better relationship, a better understanding with this IT expert that you were eventually all going to have to turn to, A, you'll be more willing to turn to them. I can't tell you how many people I know who say, well, I know this IT person or I pay this IT person, but I don't want to work with them because I can't stand talking to them. Well, I want to bring you, I want to help bring you to the point where you have enough knowledge to be confident either saying, okay, that relationship is just fundamentally unhealthy, it may be, or to say, okay, we've been miscommunicating. I understand what he's trying to do, or I understand that maybe she isn't meaning to say this, or I understand that they aren't intending to do these things. So I want to try to arm you with that knowledge. So again, an IT person here has to kind of look around and go, okay. How am I doing compared to my peers? Creates an inherently competitive mindset. So let, let's just take a moment to kind of, again, kind of rip that open and peer into the brain of a technical person, because that's what, again, I found to be the most important thing in this conversation. They're very thing oriented rather than people oriented in a people oriented industry. Uh, they want to have processes and perfection that they can't necessarily, well, they almost certainly won't achieve unless you're very blessed and you get an enormous grant and they get to just spend money on whatever they want. So there's going to be built-in frustration. They have a natural competitiveness based around their knowledge because that's how they have to gauge what they're doing. Oh, and by the way, almost every time you talk to them, it's not because you're wanting to tell them, hey, you did a great job or, oh, you know, we kind of have this long-term project. It's usually because there's an immediate problem, adding a new layer of stress on top of whatever is going on. So let's combine all those elements and what do we get? A recipe for condescension and that is where the communication breaks down. Rarely do I find that somebody says, well, my IT person just doesn't communicate clearly, you know, so, or I don't understand what they're talking about, so I can't make a decision. It's almost always, I didn't understand what this person was talking about. I tried to get clarification, and then they started talking down to me and I got frustrated. Or I didn't understand, so I kept asking, and the IT person got frustrated with me, and so things broke down. Again, nine times out of 10, when a nonprofit leader is looking for expertise in the tech world, they're not turning to try to become an expert themselves. You probably wanna go on to finding your next big program. So how do we avoid this, given that we have this toxic brew or potentially toxic brew? Well, one of the first things that we need to do is kind of turn the cat around and look at it from the text perspective. You know, I talked about there sort of being a spectrum of expertise. 
well, you as a user or any user falls somewhere on that spectrum too. And a tech has to gauge where you are at any given time. They may not know your level of expertise on any given subject, much less your overall technical comfort, which can breed a complication right away. Furthermore, and this is something that we can use to kind of figure out uh, if somebody is healthy or not. If a tech treats you poorly because you've come to them and professed ignorance, well, that kind of tells you right away that that is not a, you know, a healthy relationship. If you come to them and say, I don't know anything about this, can you please help me? And if they something, say something along the, along the lines of, you're darn right, you don't know anything about it, or you know, they roll their eyes and say, well, it's very basic, it's very easy, something like that, that person is not somebody who you should continue working with. If you come to that person and they tell you as they should, well, yeah, you don't know anything about it. I spent years doing this and you haven't. So let me help you. Boom, you've got something good there. But I digress. Techs have to look at every person they interact with and, and, and try to understand that they don't know where this person is in the technical world, uh, which leads very easily to feeling condescended to if they bring it down to the most basic level. One of the problems that I hear people say is, well, you know, the first question this tech asked me was, is it plugged in? Like I'm that dumb to not have it plugged in. Two things. Uh, one, the tech has almost certainly encountered somebody who did not realize that the thing was not plugged in. So they have to go to that basic level. Thing two, the tech doesn't know what you don't know. And they're probably going through a mental checklist. They, the first thing they have to do is go, you know, is it plugged in? If a tech actually comes to you and assumes that you know everything and they just start, you know, at 60, they don't take you from zero to 60, they just start at 60 and they just plow through and leave you behind if you don't understand what they're talking about, that's actually a sign that this person is, again, has, has toxic traits, not going to work well. So when it comes to talking tech, when a tech is reducing things to the most basic level, that's actually a sign they're probably a decent person. From their perspective, they're doing their best. Because from their perspective, people fall into three basic categories. You know, there's the first category, which is total ignorance of computers or near total ignorance of computers. These are people who oftentimes would describe themselves as being dangerous with computers or having bad tech luck. Now, maybe you fall into that bucket and that's why you're in a session about how to talk tech. And maybe you're a little bit disappointed that I wasn't here giving you a computer science course. I'm sorry, but the course that most people need is a better course on how to understand the help that we can get. Because from a text perspective, there's basically two kinds of people that fall into this bucket of, a, a, of technical ignorance. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with ignorance. Uh, again, if you're in the nonprofit world, you probably don't have time, money, or an inclination to learn these things. But you know, there's very kind people who don't know anything about computers. The kind of person who, when we all know one of them, you might be one of them, you press a button and somehow your computer catches on fire. You don't know what happened. So you bring that fiery computer to your tech and say, I'm so sorry, I don't know what happened. And if the tech is, again, a good person, somebody who you want to work with, the tech should respond, it's okay, what happened? Um, and this is where we're gonna start to get into some of the jargon versus BS and kind of clear uh, clear things up. You never should accept a tech asking the question, what did you do? What did you do is very demeaning, very uh, hostile questions, not helpful. An appropriate question for a tech to ask should be what happened or, and then what did you do next? Or what were you doing when this happened? You know, if you're in a position of leadership and you're the person that you work with on technical things regularly says, well, what did you do? It's usually a sign that that person has a closed mindset and that that person is, they're probably the jerk in that situation. If they're saying, what did you do next? Or how did this happen? They're trying to figure out what's going on. But what did you do if they're putting the blame on you right away? I got to say, you know, if we're trying to figure out if they're a jerk or not, they might be a jerk. So anyhow, if you're, if, let's just say that this is, you know, a tech ignorant person who brings it in the tech says, well, how did this happen? That's fine. But there's another kind of person who's very ignorant of tech. And we particularly see this among older men. And I hate to be uh, stereotypical here, but having lived in this world, as long as I have, I've seen it time and again, 
of people who get aggressive about their ignorance, who feel maybe embarrassed by their ignorance, who come across and say, who come across and say, you know, uh, it, it, uh, it, it shouldn't, it broke and it shouldn't be this way or it should work this way. So they get mean about it. The tech has to know right away, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that leaves them in, in a position where they have to say, it doesn't work that way and it shouldn't work that way. It immediately creates hostility. So there's the potential that the tech is just trying to get to the bottom of the situation and that the, the user is the one creating problems by not being okay with ignorance. So my biggest lesson to you is be okay with ignorance. It's okay, ask questions. Because by asking questions, that's how we're gonna learn. The second group of people is you know, the people in the middle. They have some tech knowledge, not necessarily tech experts, uh, often described as know enough to be dangerous. And I do mean enough to be dangerous. Oftentimes these people will have a problem that happens and they go out to try to solve that problem and then find out that they've caused something else because they've changed the setting or something along those lines because they had some competence in that uh you know in in, in the tech world and now the tech kind of has to go through the it expert has to go through and figure out what went wrong and not just what went wrong but what the person who had the problem did after that right again creating a situation for deep interpersonal conflict because now the tech has to say now they do have to say what did you do because the the settings aren't right you know the settings were all changed again ideally they would say and what happened next or what were you doing when this happened or how did this happen this creates the potential for serious conflict and again text not being very empathetic in general don't necessarily understand the potential for conflict here they don't understand that digging in and trying to figure out what happened can be embarrassing for somebody my number one piece of advice when it comes to talking tech is when you run into a problem, if you're not sure what's happened and you do have a reliable tech person, reach out to them. Explain to them what happened. Because when you try to take over that role, if you're not a tech expert, it does create the problem for serious miscommunications down the road. But let's just say you're in that last bucket, the smallest bucket of all, which is those people who are actually pretty darn good with computers. Ironically enough, this can create the most complicated and challenging relationship between a tech and the nonprofit leader. You know, in the case of an unhealthy tech, this creates competition where they feel like they have to prove things. Uh, if you feel like your tech is threatened by your knowledge or the person you're turned to is threatened by your knowledge, that's not a great sign. Uh, you know, it means you got to either work at that relationship or find a new person to rely on. But again, keeping it in the tech's perspective, what oftentimes happens here is that when a fairly tech savvy nonprofit leader runs into a problem, because you are not, because you are nonprofit leaders, you are problem solvers, you immediately create a solution or you go out and find a solution, bring it to the tech and say, this is the solution I want. Well, the tech may not know there was a problem. So from the tech's perspective, you come in and go, this is the solution I want. And the tech has to go, what are we fixing here? Why are we fixing this? What's happened? Why are we making this change? Now, this is really where we get into jargon versus BS. Because jargon might be, okay, well, let's just say the problem is we're changing email providers. Jargon in this situation might be somebody saying, well, there's a potential for X, Y, and Z problem with the new provider you want. You know, they're digging into some sort of problem. That gives you the opportunity to ask, what do you mean by that? How can we work around that? How serious of a problem is that? How do, can we tell the difference between just plain jargon that you know, we need to work through and ask questions about and full on BS? Well, if you clarify that and they say, well, you know, there's this technical problem here and, uh, and uh, I'm not sure it's gonna work. You say, okay, well, I'm willing to take that risk because, you know, we need to save the money over here. And then they come out with a new unrelated issue and they go immediately after that. Oh, well, not just that, but also, you know, this, this provider has got some shady reviews and also, um, you know, we're really busy. And also there's this problem over here. Once you start to see a series of unrelated things brought to the table, that's when your little BS radar should be going off. Because that's a sign of a tech who's felt challenged. You know, you've gotten in on their turf or something like that. Again, naturally competitive people, or maybe not necessarily naturally, but competitive by the nature of their work. 
now are having to determine what is going on. In some cases, they may even, again, this is in the case of, an, of a toxic tech, try to defend the status quo as not needing to change. If you know that the status quo needs to change and you continually, you have the reasons that the tech just doesn't seem to want to change, you might want to get a second opinion because there's every possibility that, that tech is just sitting there and going, well, I didn't, uh, didn't come from me, so I don't like this idea. Now, there's a much better way of handling this, again, because at the end of the day, what we all want, what both nonprofit leaders, what tech experts want is a solved problem. They want a better environment. You know, I said before that techs are, or there's more jerks per capita among techs than among just about any other industry. But not every tech is bad. Uh, and not every tech is this robot. They do have feelings and they don't want to hurt yours. It's not their objective. They want to solve a problem. So how do we get from a problem to a solution, right? That's really what this is about because as experts or as, as nonprofit leaders, you don't want to go about solving your own problems. You want the text to solve your problems for you or at least work with you. Well, again, the thing to understand is here, you have a problem. The tech doesn't necessarily know what that problem is. You see the results. You see, let me go back real fast. You see the smoky or the broken computer. But from the tech's perspective, they have to go through and go, well, wait a minute. What happened first? Then this, then this, then this. Okay, and then if it's not this thing, then it might be this thing over here. Understanding that relationship is, is key to making sure that when it comes to talking tech, you can be successful because it is a relationship. And like any relationship, it's about communication. And when it's about communication, it's really about understanding that IT people, techs, are their own breed of cat. They're weird. They don't necessarily fit in in the nonprofit world, but uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, they're needed in the nonprofit world. So communicating with them, translating between that jargon and that BS, first comes about understanding that mindset of understanding okay, this is what they're thinking, understanding that they may not necessarily intend to be hostile. It comes from asking questions. If you want to talk tech, you got to ask questions, asking them to break it down for you. And if you get resistance, if you get hostility, let me tell you something, especially if you're in the Austin area, uh, there's a lot of other techs out there who would be much more polite and much more friendly in explaining these things to you. It comes from asking questions and having confidence and knowing that it's okay to ask questions. Like I said, most techs don't wanna hurt your feelings. Most techs are happy to talk about tech things. And if you bring it, if you bring to them a question and say, how do we do this? They'll be happy to do it. So, you know, I presented that issue before of where sometimes a particularly tech savvy nonprofit leader will bring a solution to a problem to attack and that, that can create all kinds of problems. The better way to go about that is to bring your tech in and say, okay, I know this is the problem. Maybe you even already have a solution in mind. You say, I think we might do this. But make sure you've communicated clearly why you want to make a change. Because from a tech's perspective, maybe everything is running just fine. And if you have a tech that you feel like you've repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly run into communication problems with when it comes to these technical conversations, Sometimes just sitting them down and saying, hey, when you said this, it came across like you were condescending or it came across as kind of short with me. That can be very effective. You know, when it comes to communicating on technical issues, uh, telling a tech, you know, okay, I do understand this. I don't understand this. Very helpful. You know how I said that techs like to have processes, like to have systems for things? Well, in your organization, as a tech gets to know you and the people in your organization, they can kind of create a system, even a script for communicating. I have seen it where a tech has a script for saying, I'm so sorry you're dealing with this problem. That must be very frustrating. I don't like that you have this problem either, and I'd like to help you through that. Sometimes telling a tech that that's what you or your staff needs to hear is all they need, but it they don't know that until you start walking through it with them. So that's what I wanna leave you with uh, this evening is 
when it comes to talking tech, you don't have time to become an expert. So we have to rely on experts, which means we have to understand those experts, which means we have to understand their mindset. And so the mindset of a tech can be complicated, but if you approach them and understand the stresses that they must be under just by existing in the nonprofit universe, I think it can be a lot healthier. And I know it can be a very productive and uh, beneficial relationship. All right, thank you all very much. Awesome. Uh, Dallas, thank you very much. Nice. Um, been very helpful, really helping us to get a sense of where it is that uh, the tech people that we interact with might be coming from, understanding their minds as the first step towards building towards more productive relationships. I have a bunch of my own questions, but uh, before I do that, I want to open it up to see if there's anybody on the line who has a, a question that they would like to ask. Um, either drop it in the chat or just hop in, toss something out there. Hi there, first time, long time, Eli in Vancouver. So I thought this was really interesting because it was not so much of, about a technical issue, but really almost like a sociographic um, exploration of how we can work well with our colleagues. Um, you know, and I think it goes both ways. You know, most of the things you described as like, oh, things you can do to like disempower and threaten your techie. <laughs> like, oh, that's me. Every time I try to be helpful, I like, I come in and step on someone's toes. So, uh, so I thought that was really, yeah, really fascinating just to sort of open that, that thinking and way of viewing this situation up. And again, I don't want this to come across as a session for telling people, well, you know, you just need to tolerate these prima donnas which so often techs are. But this is a way of understanding maybe, okay, is my tech actually a prima donna or are they just really frustrated um, because it is a naturally frustrating job. So Dallas, I was reflecting as, as you, you spoke and uh, one of the things I kept on thinking about, um, you know, I, I think that I understood the, the case pretty well about how like, if this is a, you know, you're a, a, a nonprofit or an association and you have uh, like one tech person on your staff and that, I think you made a pretty good kind of, it was clear to me like what your next steps might be with that person in terms of like giving them a script and testing to see if they're a jerk at heart <laughs> and some of those things. Um, for those organizations or even outside of the nonprofit specific thing, but if you're like calling up a helpline or something like that where you know, it might be a random person, um, a random tech person picking up the line or responding or coming out to, to help you or if you're working with a, a service or whatever. That That's a little bit of a different situation. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on what would you recommend for the kind of, you know, kind of how, how can I or anybody, any other nonprofit leader kind of set up the first 30, 60, 90 seconds of that conversation for success, what can we do to, you know, kind of take the benefit of the doubt and create the, the situation where that tech is gonna hopefully be able to interact with us in a positive, constructive way? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to do is when you're communicating with this person is don't tell them um, what you think the problem is or what you think the end result of the problem is, tell them specifically what's happened. So a lot of times what we see in the world is somebody will say, word doesn't work. Well, okay, how does word not work? What is not working about word? Uh, or they'll say something like, well, our internet is down. You know, maybe try to, if, if you were doing anything in the first, you know, leading up to the event, Try to you know, bring them up to speed on that. I was actually on a call where somebody was telling me, yeah, our internet died. And I said, oh my gosh, I don't know what happened. Spent about half an hour trying to figure out what was going on with their Wi-Fi, only to find out, well, they had been moving the routers around and then the Wi-Fi died. And well, sure enough, it wasn't plugged in. And so, you know, in that case, it created a lot of frustration. You know, we were trying, we kept it civil, but there's a certain degree of frustration. Like, I don't understand what's going on here. So starting off by, by telling the person uh, exactly what the nature of the problem is, not what you think the problem is, but just, you know, literally read the message if you need to, uh, telling them kind of what happened leading up to it, and then uh, 
just being open, you know, maybe you can even tell them up front, I'm bad with computers. Um, I don't necessarily know this. If you feel comfortable just, you know, starting off by saying, if you can jump on my computer, you know, if you have some sort of remote access system, something like that, just kind of let them know your comfort level. So that way they can know, okay, I kind of know what I'm dealing with here. Cool, thank you. Um, and digging a little bit deeper on kind of connecting with that, that tech person, do you have any story that you might be able to share with us of kind of where somebody was able to kind of turn a situation around and maybe it even gotten a little bit sticky, but where the non-tech person was able to appeal to the, the angels of their own better nature to kind of work with that tech person and to turn the conversation from a, a difficult one to one that was going to be constructive? Absolutely. Uh, you know, this comes from our own, uh, as embarrassing as it is to say, you know, when you've got a bad story that comes from your own company, but we all do, uh, particularly every tech company will have bad stories. You know, we had a tech who I know for a fact isn't a jerk, but uh, can come across that way occasionally and had a really bad run in with somebody like you were saying. And, you know, it came across as condescending. It was just, it was deeply unhealthy. And it, because I'm kind of in a leadership position, it became my problem because this person, the, the client came to me and said, this is really bad. I don't ever want to speak to this person again, ever. So it was kind of a process of saying, totally understand that. Uh, you know, if at the end of our conversation that we have, you still feel that way, you won't have to, but I'm going to encourage you to give it one more try. I'm going to have a conversation with this person because from the text perspective, he thought that actually things were pretty much okay because they didn't leave screaming at each other. Again, we're talking about generally speaking, low empathy people. And so from their perspective, you know, as long as you didn't end up punching one another, eh, we're probably okay. Maybe some feathers were ruffled, but you know, things are fine. So I had to go to that tech and say, things are not good at all. You need to apologize. Not only do you need to apologize, next time there's a problem, you need to go over and above. The tech was shocked. He had no idea there had been a problem. So he apologizes. A few months later, there's a problem. And what does the tech do? Because he's created this system, you know, he had a note, hey, you were really mean to this, or this person thought you were really mean last time. So the tech goes, I'm on this as quickly as I can. Made sure to communicate in a way, now that he knows this person, you know, whether they misinterpreted his tone or whether he, you know, realized that sometimes his tone could be misinterpreted, he made extra steps to make sure that the tone couldn't be misinterpreted. And so he took those steps to go, okay, I'm gonna be kind about this. You know, if you have a tech in your office, so often what I see is, cause I, you know, we do work with some organizations that have full-time techs on staff. So often the tech is in the back basement office you know, way off because, and maybe that's by their own choosing because they want to kind of be left alone to figure things out. But it does create a sense of distance. So, you know, as a leader, reaching out and just every once in a while talking to the person about something that isn't a problem is huge because it can help remind this person or showing how the work they do impacts uh, the work that the organization is doing. Because so often a tech can easily fall into this rut where the problem, you know, where it's, okay, the printer's broken, the network is down, this computer is broken. The printer's broken, the network is down, the computer's broken, over and over and over again. Occasionally telling that person, hey, thanks for fixing this because, uh, you know, we really needed to get this grant so that way we could help out this community in need or something like that. Making sure they see not just that, their that they fixed a problem, but that they empowered the organization to help somebody is huge. It's huge. Excellent. Is your day quill hanging on long enough for one more question? It is. I, I think my voice is going, but I, I think I got one more question. All right. All right. We'll, we'll do that. And, and I don't see anybody else hopping in. So I'm going to, I'm going to take that opportunity <laughs> for myself. Um, Dallas, if there's anybody who's tuned in today or who's watching the recording and really did want to literally get into the jargon, uh, literally wanted to up their own game on understanding technology. Do you have any recommendations for that person, resources they might go to, to kind of go from, you know, I, we know you're not 
you know, it takes years to go from zero to a hundred on this, but you know, for somebody who wants to go from zero to five, zero to 10, um, are there any resources that, that you're familiar with that you like that they might use to be able to really start to get a, a better appreciation of the technology and really some of the, some of those things. So they know what, what the cloud is and what a server is and you know, what's a DNS and all that. Oh, absolutely. You know, ironically enough, uh, my recommendations would often be in 10 and TechSoup. <laughs> you know, because I have had those where somebody says, I just don't have the budget or, you know, uh, I'm launching something, you know, and so we're really early on. So I do have the time to try to bone up on IT things. Where should I go? So often I point them to you guys. Um, but, you know, just ironically enough, or maybe not ironically enough, oddly enough, Reddit has a lot of really great resources where you can get very specific answers to very specific questions, jumping on to, you know, just literally Googling whatever it is you want to know about following it with the word Reddit. You can almost always find a thread. And on that thread, yes, sometimes there's going to be mean people, but there's also a lot of people who just love talking about that thing that you're interested in. And so posting a question, like if you just want to say, I know nothing about the cloud, somebody walk me through the advantages and disadvantages, you'll get an answer like within a day and it'll be an encyclopedic answer. Believe it or not, techs use Reddit all the time um, for solving problems. There's kind of a, a joke that, you know, one, the IT person's biggest tool is Google. It's not, it's Reddit. I've seen so many techs turn to it for quick answers, for full answers at all levels of expertise. Excellent, excellent, thank you. And uh, since I don't know that the, um, uh, chat will necessarily go with the recording. Uh, Eli dropped in there. It looks like his favorite. He says, I love stackoverflow.com for questions. So for the benefit of the recording. Um, Dallas, thank you so much for being here. Eli, thank you so much for making sure that our technology would hold together and that we were able to broadcast on Facebook Live and all that other stuff. Do either of you have any uh, parting words for us? I'm good. I want to say uh, thank you. And I really want to say to you, Sean, thank you so much for leading this. Um, you know, these community groups don't happen by accident. They happen because someone steps up and says, damn it, it's going to happen and I'm going to make it happen. All right. All right. Well, thank you both. And uh, yeah, good evening. We'll be seeing you again in a month, if not sooner. Got it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.